Hello, my name is Paul Sevilla and I'm a librarian for the Livermore Public Library. Tonight's program is part of Livermore Reads Together, celebrating this year's featured book, The Reason I Jump, The Inner Voice of a 13-Year-Old Boy with Autism by Naoki Higashida. Thank you to the friends of the Livermore Library for their generous support of Livermore Reads Together. Tonight's program will be a live conversation between our two guests. I will be monitoring the chat and uh, I encourage the community to type in their questions and comments on the chat for our Q&A. It's an honor for me to introduce our guests this evening. Our first guest, based in Washington, D.C., Eric Garcia is the senior Washington correspondent for The Independent. Previously, he was an assistant editor at the Washington Post's Outlook section and an associate editor at The Hill and a correspondent for National Journal, Market Watch, and Salon.com. And, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Market Watch and Roll Call. He has also written for the Daily Beast, The New Republic, and Salon.com. Eric Garcia is a graduate of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He is the author of the groundbreaking book, We're Not Broken, Changing the Autism Conversation. Eric just did a, a Livermore Public Library program with me last Monday to, awesome. uh, to talk about his book, but he enjoyed it so much that he decided to participate in tonight's conversation. <laughs> Thank you for joining us again, Eric. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Now, let me introduce our second guest this evening. Steve Silverman is an award-winning science writer whose articles have appeared in Wired, The New York Times, The New Yorker, and many other publications. He is the author of Neurotribes, the Legacy of Autism and the Future of Neurodiversity, which Oliver Sacks called a sweeping and penetrating history presented with a rare sympathy and sensitivity. The book became a widely praised bestseller in the United States and the United Kingdom and won the 2015 Samuel Johnson Prize for nonfiction. His TED Talk, The Forgotten History of Autism, has been viewed more than a million times and translated into 25 languages. He lives with his husband, Keith, in San Francisco and is now working on a book about cystic fibrosis. His Twitter account, if you want to follow him, is at Steve Silberman. Welcome, Steve. It's an honor to meet you. It's an honor to meet you. And it's really an honor to have Eric Garcia here, too, because um, We're Not Broken is a book that I kind of, in a way, was fantasizing about without knowing it. I thought to myself while I was writing Neurotribes, someday an autistic person is going to write uh, a book that reframes autism in the same way that I'm trying to do that, but bringing his own lived experience to the subject. And uh, I was absolutely thrilled uh, to get to know Eric for one, and then to read his book. And uh, it's so important that not just we ch the society changes its mind about autism, but that neurotypical society learns to listen to autistic people when they tell their own stories. And Eric does both of those things in his book. Uh, it's, it's a very uh, scholarly book and it very much shows his experience as a reporter, but it also shows his experience as an autistic person. And that is just a wonderful thing. And may there be many, many more books in the future written by yes. autistic people. 
Well, thank you very much for the kind words, Steve. Um, you know, Steve and I have become friends. Uh, we, we actually met, and so I had interviewed Steve for a piece that I wrote for National Journal a while back, but then as fate would have it, we met in the most autistic way possible, which was we were, I was taking a train up to New York City and I'm like two seats away from me, there's a guy in suspenders talking on the phone. And I'm just like, wait, and I'm like, is that Steve Silverman? I think I talked to them. And then, like, we became friends through that way. And then we just started chatting. We followed each other on Twitter. We became, we, we became legitimate friends. And Steve, I, I say this with all sincerity, your family. Oh, um, and and, and to, to, I was telling Paul earlier, and I was, I was showing Steve, if you want to understand how much my book, We're Not Broken, was influenced by Steve's book, this is all, these are all the That's bookmarkers hilarious. and highlighters of awesome. everything that is from great. my book uh, that, that, that I looked at Steve, Steve's book. And, you, you know, a lot of people wonder why I didn't go into the history that much or why I didn't, you know, and, and the reason why I say it is because Steve already did that, you know, um, to, to, to borrow from Jay-Z, Hove did it so you don't have to. So <laughs> with that in mind, let's, you know, let's get this show on the road. So, you, you, you know, you, you open by saying that it's important to listen to autistic people and their lived experiences, but as a neurotypical author, uh, why did you write Neurotribes and what were you trying to accomplish when you set out to write about autism? Well, let me preface this by saying that something that has been very interesting to me is that... Um, when my book first came out, a lot of people asked me, do you have an autistic child? And I would say no. And they would say, are you on the spectrum yourself? Like that's if they were really hip, they would say. That. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? And then I would say, no, I'm not. And then they'd be like, well, why did you write a book about autism? And I actually, you know, it's easy to shrug that off, but I actually want to give it a really close look because I think I know why they're asking me that. And I think the reason why they're asking me that is that autism was mistakenly believed to be very rare for a yes. very long time. And not only that, many of the books that were written and still are written are written from the perspective of parents and yes. um, uh, you know, talking about the difficulties of raising a child on the spectrum. Yes. And what almost offended me, although I wouldn't be, you know, I wasn't offended like, with the person asking, but what almost offended me was like, wait, you know, like I can't any, you know, I'm a science writer. Like, of course, autism is interesting. And not only that, at the time that I was writing it, um, there was this, well, I guess there still is now, unfortunately, it came back in a big way, but there was this mistaken belief that vaccines caused autism. And so really what, what it had, the reason why I wrote it was that Way back in two, the year 2000, I took this cruise called the Geek Cruise with mm -hmm. a bunch of computer programmers uh, up to Alaska. And um, I noticed that they were brilliant. They were wonderful. Yes. Um, they had really intense interests. And many of them were kind of socially awkward in a way that's very mm -hmm. familiar. And so yeah. what I think I was seeing on that boat was what's called in you know the science world the broad autism phenotype yes um, people who are on the spectrum somewhere maybe not all of them would get a diagnosis but um certainly have spectrum traits uh and what i noticed back then in 2000 which uh eventually led me to write an article for wired called the geek syndrome was that people with spectrum traits often had autistic kids. And yes. so, so that was the, you know, kind of the big secret in, you know, that was almost um, obscured by all the BS about vaccines was that autism is genetic primarily. And uh, many people who are autistic have parents with autistic traits or other relatives in the family tree. Yeah, And so I wrote my book because I was frustrated by the fact that even though everyone was talking about autism by the time, like when I started writing about autism in 2000, 
hardly anybody was talking about autism. Huh. But you know, when I wrote Neurotribes, everybody was talking about autism. <laughs> but but they were talking about vaccines, and they were yeah. you know. So if there was a you know if there was an article, uh, you know, even in the New York Times or whatever the comment sections would be all about vaccines, you know? Yeah. And so I thought to myself, why haven't we figured out whether vaccines cause autism or not? Like there have been a bunch yeah. of studies, doesn't look like there are, but why haven't people figured this out? And the reason why they hadn't figured it out was because of that slope of rising diagnoses that yes. started in the 90s. And so you know, I kept looking at that slope and whenever it was talked about, even by major media, they would say, the reason for the dramatic rise in diagnoses is unclear. It's a puzzle, you know, et cetera. And I'm like, why is it such a puzzle? Like, why can't we figure this out? And so I started to do the research that led to neurotribes. And I, you know, in about a year or so, it took me five years to, to write, but in about a year or so, I figured out, that the timeline of autism's discovery was wrong. And that yes. if you knew the correct timeline, the reason for that dramatic rise in diagnoses um, was not only clear, you saw that it was good news yes. because there was more people getting help. And you know the, the floodgates to the diagnosis were opened a bit. Now they're trying to narrow them again. Um, and I think that's purely political, uh, responding to political pressure from people who think autism is being overdiagnosed. It's certainly it not being overdiagnosed among people of color, among women, um, and among people who don't have access to healthcare. Um, yeah, Eric, I'm curious, how do you, when you hear someone say like, oh, it's being overdiagnosed, these kids are just talking to each other on TikTok and you know, like, yeah. how do you feel? How does that make you feel? You know, my, my response to that is usually um, uh, the over, whenever you, people say that it's overdiagnosed, my response mm -hmm. is, no, if anything, we uh, were underdiagnosing it. If you look at, as, as you said, people of color. Right. Uh, and the other thing that I say is that like, well, TikTok like anything with the internet, there's good and bad with the internet. Mm -hmm. But what TikTok and what uh, I mean, I'm an I'm a millennial. Gen Z is like, and TikTok is like, you know, a little bit after me. But like, you know, right, but like right. my my, my <laughs> I've tried doing it. My mom is better at TikTok than I am. But like, oh wow. <laughs> uh, but like, my whole thing is like, well, this might be a way for them to communicate, and because. Right. It's so criminally misunderstood, even today, even though Gen Z is kind of that generation after the DSM change, after, um, you know, schools had to report to the federal government that they, that they, um, uh, which students they're serving, there's still a lot of mis misunderstanding. So if anything, discussions amongst each other and discussions amongst um uh, in discussions on social media might be a way to foster a community and bring better understanding to yourself. And that might actually lead to a formal diagnosis. So my response, whenever that there's this discussion of overdiagnosis, my answer is always, okay, to whom are we overdiagnosing? Because right. it sure isn't the communities that I see. It sure isn't um, a lot of, other people. you know, literally uh, I was uh, looking, there was this one reality TV star on The Bachelorette, like two weeks ago, she came in and said like, oh, I'm 27 and I got diagnosed as autistic. That's not, you know, on one end it shows, okay, more people can get a diagnosis. But think about it, that's 27 years not knowing you're autistic. That's right. 27 years not getting social services at your school, getting social services at your work, you know. So so whenever I hear people say, oh, it's kids on TikTok uh, or, or, or it's kids on social media, even the, the whole thing about self-diagnosis, my whole thing is um, a lot of health insurance companies, um, don't cover the diagnosis and it can go anywhere from like four thousand to five thousand dollars you know you and i right. both know john marble and yeah. he talked about how he had to save up money to get right. the diagnosis right. it is not cheap so i can understand so like if somebody's self-diagnosing because they don't necessarily need the, need the piece of paper for work or school things like that i'm okay with that so 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 that's a long way of going about your answer to say like people need to chill out when you say oh there's over diagnosis for sure. And there are so many stereotypes about 
yes. how autistic people are, that people who don't fit those stereotypes, like they need to be able to figure out um, that they're autistic or not um, yes. without necessarily everyone around them uh, being able to recommend the right kind of diagnosis because <laughs> most people walk around with stereotypical autistic people are men, they're white men, they're tech geeks, they're, you know, so if you're a, a woman who likes weaving and, you know, not, and Doctor Who, and, you know, you're not some guy on atypical, you know, you don't get the same access to, uh, to diagnosis. Um, and, you know, I think another thing that's happening, if I can speak sort of from the heart on this, Go ahead. And, yeah, is that um, when I started writing about autism back in 2000, I was writing, I was a science writer for Wired Magazine, writing from what autistic people now call the medical model. So I was looking at autism as a disorder, a word I never use anymore. Yeah. Um, I was looking at it as a diagnosis, uh, et cetera. Now that I have not only written neurotribes, but have tons of autistic friends, um, in fact, there are a couple of my autistic friends may be in the audience right now, which would be wonderful. Yeah, they are. I'm looking at them. Right <laughs> yeah, now. That's yeah. cool. Um, Hi, hello, everybody. hello, hello. Um, <laughs> I know. I, I no longer look at autism as a diagnosis, or a, I certainly don't look at it as a disorder. I look at it as a flavor of humanity, yes. and it's a flavor of humanity that was stigmatized as a diagnosis, very much like. One might say, you know, when I was in high school, yes. I was in the DSM because yeah. I, you know, I was homosexual, you know? Yeah. And uh, still I am, by the way, happily <laughs> married, by the way. Um, <laughs> and, you know, when I was in high school, you could go to jail or be put in a mental asylum if you were caught making out with your boyfriend. You know, I, I got beaten up all the time for being gay. Yeah. I, uh, you know, the thought of getting married, no. My, you know, when I came out to my parents, bless their hearts, I have to say, but, and they improved on this later, but they sent me to a therapist for the cure. You know, wow. luckily the therapist was awesome because it's about like the third session. I said, do, do you mind if I ask you how much this is costing my parents? Because my parents were like, poor school teachers, you know, yes. and, and uh, she said, oh, it's, I think it's $80 an hour, which was a lot of money back at the center. Yeah, it is. That's a lot and, of money today. Right, exactly. And so I, I said to her, do you think I need to be here? And she said, you know, you seem perfectly happy to me. <laughs> so I said, could you please tell that to my parents? You know, so she did. And then I no longer had to go to the therapist, you know, but mm -hmm. um when I think of how much has changed, like, you know, a lot of times I talk to autistic people who are uh, completely understandably depressed about the yeah. state of acceptance and, and uh, stigmatization and everything else. And I say, well, let's put it this way. When I was in high school, I was considered mentally ill and could have been forcibly confined to an institution just for falling in love with my best friend, which I did all the time. Um, now I'm legally married. That's a huge social shift. And, in, in, you know, now, of course, what we have to watch out for is I, I, I think that the Republicans are aiming towards undoing uh, marriage yeah. equality. Um, but we don't have to get into that right now. But yeah. yeah. And I think on top of that, I think one of the things that's important to do to, to note is how hard one these um, progress for the LGBTQ community is plus community and the disability community. One of the things that you see is that the point that I always make is that the ADA is only as old as I am. Yeah. And it's been under legal assault since the beginning. Yeah. Uh, and in the same way, you know, the, the, you know, there have been attempts to undo it. I mean, you, you, you see you see it now in Texas with transgender children. And there's, of course, as you and I know, a lot of intersection between the transgender community and the autistic community as well. So 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 that, that's important. And one of the things that, to your point that I always make is that, you know, an example of how much we got things wrong is that 
homosexuality was in the DSM when autism was still seen as an offshoot of schizo- like a symptom of schizophrenia. Right. It didn't have its own separate diagnosis until 1980. Right. And that goes to my next question because because you and I discussed this on Twitter. Like mm-hmm. I remember you 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 discussed it in my book and we and, and we, we could do. But like you mentioned your old friend, you know your old mentor Allen Ginsberg, and mm-hmm. what that ta- and what that taught mm-hmm. taught you about mm-hmm. being a gay man and, and other things. Like feel free to feel free to go feel free to go to riff on that. Yeah. You know? Oh sure. Well, uh, yeah. What I mentioned something that hardly anyone knows in reference to uh, neurotribes is that one of the biggest influences on it was the poet Allen Ginsberg. And I knew Allen. Uh, I was his student when I was 19. Then I was his teaching assistant uh, 10 years later. Then I was his friend. And Allen's two best known poems are Howl and Kaddish. Um, Both of them take a very strong stand to advocate for and defend from stigma people with mental illness. And Alan had a lot of personal experience with that when he was young because his mother had schizophrenia and um, she actually died of the results of a botched lobotomy in a mental asylum. And um, Howell was written after Alan himself was sent to a, a mental institution where he met a guy named Carl Solomon, who uh, he dedicated the poem to. And um, both Howell and Kaddish are very much about humanizing people who have been dehumanized by capitalist society, basically. Uh, And so that included gay people, that included uh, junkie, you know, drug addicts, that included uh, people in mental asylums. And it was really an attempt to shower blessings on people upon whom violence and brutality was usually showered on. And yeah. so um, Howell and Kaddish are, are acts of poetic redemption that work by paying attention to people who are usually ignored. Mm. And while I was writing Neurotribes, I changed my thinking from the medical yes. model to a civil rights model. Yes. What I was seeing was the birth of a new civil rights movement in the neurodiversity yes. movement. And once I made that shift, I realized that what was called for was, you know, if I was going to be Alan's, you know, <laughs> worthy, you know, successor, not successor, but student, um, yeah. you know, was a redemptive push to humanize people who had been excluded, bullied, murdered, left out of society, allowed to die. You know, you notice how quickly all the bad stuff comes back. Like with COVID, you know, you have in England, autistic people, their, you know, their parents would find out that a do not resuscitate order had been signed for them, you know, by the institution. How quickly, um, you know, neurotypical society or capitalist society decided that autistic people, people with Down syndrome, well, yes. we, you know, they're expendable. COVID is rough, you know, like, yeah, what are you going to do? You know, very yeah. quickly. And, you know, needless to say, one of the big shocks for me since writing Neurotribes, and it really is a, it's a horrible shock, actually, is how quickly Nazis came back. Huh. You know, I certainly didn't think I was writing about, um, you know, that Nazis were going to take over America when I was writing Neurotribes. <laughs> well, you know, um, we're there. I mean, people are marching with swastikas and yeah. Confederate flags. And, um, and you know, shall I say, one of the two major parties in America is not yeah. distancing itself from white supremacist messaging. Yeah. Um, so... That was a shock, and it looks like it's going to be an even harder. I had this, I must say, naive view of social progress when I wrote Neurotribes. It was like, okay, gay people are cool now. We can get married. So next, autistic people will be cool. No, no, it's not that easy. You know, we're going to have to fight on the front lines again, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. You don't have to tell me, as you know, I live in Washington, D.C. I don't know if I told you, uh, 
not the apartment I live in now, but the apartment I lived before, uh, there were a bunch of the people who later, a bunch of Trump supporters, like on January 6th, they were literally staying across the street from my apartment. And afterward, oh, like yeah. after there was a curfew, they were looking for, they were spoiling for a fight. Um, right. This was after the curfew, like at 6 p.m. And like, they were just out smoking cigarettes. People really proud of themselves. But, uh, you know, I don't know if they were the specific ones who went in, but they were clearly happy about what happened. That being, and, and that that goes to this other thing, which is that you mentioned the um, the worthiness of it, because even before you're, you're seeing now people say, oh, well, COVID is rough. You know, you, you, you know, there's, you know, the, the CDC director saying people who are dying who are already vaccinated are people who are unwell to begin with. Right. Um, yeah, that was really bad. Jesus Christ. Um, so, but, but, but I think one of the things that you see, you mentioned this is that now, whereas in the past, there was not, you, you know, um, in the past, there weren't people who could push back. There weren't, there wasn't a vocal vociferous autism rights movement. There weren't neurodiverse or neurodiversity. That they were in institutions or they were going undiagnosed or something. Now there seems to be other things. In what ways has, um, in what ways has the neurodiversity movement changed in a way that it didn't in 2015, which is when your book came out? Well, um, I'm very happy to say that now I feel, I feel like there's much more artistic representation in mainstream media. Like when I started, when Neurotimes was published, um, I'd been trying to do this actually for a couple of years before it was published, but when, if I would get a call uh, from a yes. reporter, you know, about an article about autism, I would always say, have you talked to autistic adults? And yeah. they almost always said no. And, you know, yes. so it was as if every article in every newspaper about feminism quoted only men, you know? <laughs> um, and oh, so still do. It, Right, exactly. And, <laughs> you know, autistic people, I, I felt like the whole social discussion of autism, which was, as I say, obsessive by 2015, um, was behind the backs of autistic people. It was just yes. neurotypicals chattering at each other. Yes. And, um, you know, and if there was an autistic person in, in an article, they were a child who was causing a terrible burden for their, yes. for their parents, you know. And, um, I mean, it was no... Uh, wonder to me that autistic people avoided the autism conferences that I went to while researching the book because it was nothing but hearing themselves being described as a burden. And I remember one truly shocking uh, moment that I still haven't gotten over. I went to uh, like the big, I forget what conference it was, but it was like the big autism science conference of the year. And they gave a Lifetime Achievement Award to a, a woman who might have done some good work. But when they asked her what it was like when she was starting out, she said, well, when I was starting out in autism research, it was basically veterinary medicine. And there was like this silence in the room. Nobody said anything. It was like, what? Like, I, you what? know, I could only, I knew there were some autistic people there. I was like, Jesus Christ, like she thinks she can still say that, you know? Would you, would you be the right to say it? Yeah. Right. And so now someone legit said that. Someone who just got, uh, yeah, my friend That's Kevin it. Carroll is out there. Um, yeah. Yes, it was really messed up. Um, and uh, so now autistic people do go to those conferences. They make themselves heard. They make themselves heard on the uh, Interagency Autism Coordinating Committee. Um, and so now autistic people have input into the autism research agenda, finally, at last. And, yes. um, you know, some people are not happy about that. Um, yeah. And good. I'm glad they're not happy. Uh, yeah. they, you know, <laughs> they deserve to be challenged. Um, so, you know, now we see with Sia's music um, oh. that you certainly wrote about, what, when that whole thing started, what were you watching for in the culture to see what would happen? You know, so initially I wanted, so I can say I was a fan of Sia, like as a singer and a performer or whatever. Like mm -hmm. I thought, you know, that, that's fine. So like, 
you have to remember, like the, the trailer came out the week after the elect, the week or week after the election in 2020, and I was fatigued as most political journalists are. You know, I think as the country was just because, and that was before January 6th. But like that's a whole other thing. Uh, but but like so like I was like oh let me see what this chant. You know, I heard see has a thing, and I was like, okay, I'm gonna go in with like complete just open mind, open heart. And I saw the trailer and I was like, okay, this is, and then like, I heard her say that like, it's Rain Man for girls. And like, look, Rain Man was, you, your book was, you know, talks about where it was groundbreaking and where it falls short. At the time, and, right. Yeah, yeah, you know, and, and and every piece of art and culture is, you know, a product of the time, you know, but like my whole thing was like, Rain Man was 30 years ago, you know. Right, it was, right. and, and then I think what I saw, what, what, this is this is a roundabout way of saying is that what I don't think Sia expected and this is why I think that the backlash why she was so jolted and why Hollywood was kind of jolted about it was that um, she expected universal plaudits for it for oh a celebrity is doing a thing about autism and a love letter to autism awareness that word awareness, awareness awareness Yes. And, uh, you know, it, it was, uh, but then like what I don't think that they expected uh, is that from what I understand, it took like a few years to make it like it started making it like 2017 or something like that, is that they didn't, ex- is that and the entertainment industry hadn't caught up. Politics is still caught catching up. It's playing catch up, mm-hmm. but like there were some big monumental shifts that I'll that I talk about in my book, and you know because you, you know that happened in the political culture at the time, with autistic people protesting at the Capitol, things like that, advising presidential candidates. Um, the but what happened was I think that the entertainment industry hadn't seen that now autistic people were going to push back, and I think it kind of shocked and surprised. It was a shock to the system that Sia didn't was it, it didn't immediately get a bunch of thank yous from you know autistic right, people. exactly right i think that she, right. i think like she legitimately just did didn't expect that there would be this, this backlash and then that was when she said uh you know maybe you're just a bad actor to to one autistic person and like yeah geez i yeah. i wanted to cast an autistic person but it was too overwhelming as if that's like well maybe you should change your movie making so that it's more accessible and I mean, right, or, right. or that it's sensory friendly or all that so i think that generally as a whole the entertainment industry just didn't expect that this was happening and i think also the other thing that's important and i, I don't think this can be understated is that this came a little less than a year into, but definitely it felt like much longer, a pandemic that was disproportionately killing developmentally disabled people. Yeah. And this was already, autistic people and disabled people as a whole were already at their wits end. Right, right. uh, Because you had seen um, not just the Trump administration, but a lot of hospital systems in blue states as well saying, well, we don't need to resuscitate. You, you know, you talk about the you know, resuscitate, now right. you need to provide care. Uh, so so a lot of people were, uh, a lot of autistic people were at were up to here. And then when you see Sia just go belligerent, that I think was like, okay, well, this shows that they didn't, uh, they haven't learned anything. And at the same time, what had been happening is that you had seen some not many, but you'd seen some shows like Everything's Gonna Be Okay, casting autistic people. Uh, yeah. You'd seen uh, Loop, which is uh, a Disney Pixar show. Loop short. is amazing. Loop it's is beautiful. awesome. Yeah. And Erica Milsom had consulted with the, the person who plays the non speaking autistic girl, is a non speaking autistic girl of color. They did the recording in her house. So they didn't. Ex- so I think that they just, I, th- I think that like autistic people had seen. Maybe on a smaller scale, but like Pixar's big, you know. Yeah. Pixar's a multi multi billion dollar studio or something like that, and yep. it's distributed through Disney. They saw there is no excuse for this. Yeah. So that was already. So it was already. There was this tidal wave already cresting, and then the moment right. I think when it came out, when I think some previews came out that showed restraint and seclusion. Right. When that happened. That was just like, I think that was one of those things that it's a lot like when I talk about the Judge Roddenberg Center with people. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Uh, for those who don't know, the Judge Roddenberg Center is a facility in Massachusetts that administers shock therapy 
Steve goes into it more in his book. So read his book if you haven't read it. Um, uh, uh, toward autistic and otherwise developmentally disabled people. And it's one of those things where like you and I, I think because we've known about it for so long, we can mention, mm-hmm. we, we talk about it with us. But then mm-hmm. like when somebody I'm not hanging out with is like, wait, what? You know, yeah, right. I think when they saw how barbaric the use of restraint and seclusion was, yeah, that was just the moment where it was like, okay, Sia said that she had to retract. Uh, she, she tried to l- delete the scenes. The when I saw the, the the actual online version, it hadn't deleted it. Uh, you, you know, and that was just it, it was in some ways a it was the entertainment industry not being. Uh, not catching up to it and being oblivious, but it was also a neurodiversity movement that had its footing, yeah. that had built its footing in a way that had been decades in the making. But now it was like, it, it, it had this um, firm uh, footing and it had enough of a pull in the culture. And I, I've, I've said this, like I think also in a weird way, the pandemic helped a little bit hmm. because I think that, well, yes, it was tragic seeing how many autistic people died, but I think that I don't think that just having one protest in front of the studios in Hollywood mm-hmm. would have had as much impact. This was a concerted person after person on TikTok, Twitter, Instagram, just saying, no, this is terrible. To yeah. the extent that uh, even like a few months ago, my mom called me and said, Eric, have you heard of this terrible movie called Music? Oh, that's hilarious. And I was that's like, great. have I heard of it? <laughs> yeah. Have I heard? You, you know, so, so, yeah. so, yeah. so that was- and, that's, and Eric, that's something that you point out has really changed about the culture is that yeah. now autistic people have very prominent voices in conversations about autism. I mean, maybe we're all like, you know, like living in Twitter too much or something, but yeah. uh, it's going on, you know? And, I don't, I don't think, yeah. and uh, yeah. so many media people are on Twitter that it then filters out through the media through including example you, you know? And, and yeah, uh, like, I mean, that, that that's a good point because I think to your point about media and media and gatekeeping, so many of us, all of us probably need to log off for a little bit, but um, but on top of that, I think that it's helpful because like you said, a lot of people in the media are on Twitter. And then because autistic people have built a kind of critical mass on Twitter, in the past, when one of the things a lot of people don't realize about journalists, that you and I know this, is that we, as much as we like to see ourselves as anti-authority and the kids throwing spitballs in the back of the classroom, we kind of lean on authority. We lean on people who are gatekeepers. We lean on mm-hmm. people because we, our job is to not know and then know stuff. Right. And I think in the past that when we were looking up stuff, we would just go on Google and these are the leading authority. You know, this is a professor at Harvard. This is a professor at Yale. We, and that came at the expense of excluding autistic people who are not seen as experts. Right. Now, there is a way that I couldn't have written my book had there not been Twitter, because that was how I met some autistic people who maybe couldn't be interviewed, who were not speaking, who couldn't be interviewed over the, over the phone, or some yeah. who maybe could have been interviewed in person, but needed time and needed a break and needed to like, needed me to send those questions. So that's a media sea change. I think, and you, you mentioned, and we, we We've had a lot of these. It's funny because the book came out in 2015 and you mentioned you're happily married now. It's interesting because Neurotribes came out after the Obergefell decision, which basically made same-sex marriage the law of the land. Mm -hmm. A few months later, Hillary Clinton became the first presidential candidate to release a autism-specific plan. Yeah, And I remember that because my plan was, I was working on my book proposal at the time, and I thought that, like, I had done it with the expectation that, okay, it'll come out by 2017, the book will come out by 2017, and Hillary Clinton will have released the autism plan, then Trump gets elected. So, we talk about the positive, let's, and we talked a little bit about Nazis, but let's talk about the negative, and specifically, you know this, and you've talked with me about that, we've talked about this at length, mm-hmm. what ways has the COVID vaccine panic how was the groundwork laid by the uh, autism vaccine panic? Well, that's definitely the way to put it. Um, I mean, the, the anti-vaccine movement is a lot older than COVID. And in fact, it's a lot older than autism. Um, but 
what the anti-vaccine movement with autism did following the bogus lie BS study by Andrew Wakefield was that they grew a sort of social media ecosystem to yes. spread their BS. And in fact, one of the um, one of the first things that I saw, remember I was talking about how if there was an article about autism in the New York Times, the yes. comment sections or any paper really, the comment yes. section would always be dominated by com comments about vaccines. I remember when, you know, I would sometimes say, well, actually, you know, the study was just done and, you know, it's, d d d aut autism is not caused by vaccines. People would accuse me of being a shill for big pharma. Oh. I had actually um, written about big pharma very critically for Wired yes. multiple times. I was certainly not a, sh you know, can big pharma be evil? Yes. Um, yes. Can they even kill people? Yes. Yes. Um, but that's not what was going on with autism and vaccines. And yes. of course, you had Trump, who was very involved in the anti-vaccine movement from the beginning. And yes. in fact, I, I wrote an article for Stat News um, right at the beginning of his uh, presidency that said something like, you know, Mr. Trump, please do not become the first anti-vaccine president. And he was like, really uh involved like his the landlord of his campaign office in florida was like huge anti-vaxxer yeah something um, like that yeah who goes and, to mar-a-lago frequently or something. right yeah. exactly and um so they had in a sense created an ecosystem to support alternate facts as mm. you know as the Trump administration used as to say. As Kellyanne Conway would say. Right, right, exactly. And um, so there was already like this huge proportion of people who were, you know, kind of already prepared not to trust authority, yes. you know, to hate Anthony Fauci or, you know, God yes. knows. And, you know, I had met Anthony Fauci during the AIDS epidemic when he was, you know, very much a hero. And one of the reasons why he was a hero was because he wasn't a hero at the beginning, but he eventually met with ACT UP and yes. helped them helped ACT as, a, as a, uh, a middleman in a sense between ACT UP and the pharmaceutical companies. And yes. um, so, you know, Anthony Fauci was a hero to me, but we already have this uh, alternative facts ecosystem, Fox News being the largest broadcaster of that. And so, when COVID came out, there was already like all these megaphones in place to spread That's bullshit, important. basically. Yes. And, and uh, it, it's been amazing to see how opportunistic the anti-vaccine people have been in embracing clearly right-wing ideas, in, which surprised me a bit in part because not all anti-vaxxers are right-wing. Some of them come oh. from the left wing. They come yeah. from like Marin County, you know, right? Exactly, and they're you know they're you know hippies or whatever. <laughs> don't, you know, yeah. don't trust. I mean, I had certain friendships end over COVID trutherism with people who I thought of as progressives because yeah. the, you know they they were not willing to believe um, the advice you know to like stay home or put on a mask, yeah. and. Um, so there was already all this ground laid by the autism anti-vax movement for the COVID truther movement or health freedom, which is one of the darkest, most um, ironic um, phrases ever invented. Freedom uh, to yeah. die, thank you. Yeah, yeah. You know? yeah. Uh, we tried, we almost had, we had some of the truckers try to, thankfully they got, they didn't make it into, you know, but like Robert F. Kennedy cut his teeth with the autism stuff and then now he's talking about Nazis of the Lincoln Memorial. Um, we now should probably go to questions. Sure, so, yeah. Paul, can we, um, do yeah. you, do, are, are there, yeah. Hey, Paul. Thank can, you, Eric anybody? and Steve. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. We open it up to questions. Uh, type in your questions uh, on the chat. Um, there's been a lot of good discussion on the chat here. A lot of uh, good discussion. Uh, let's see. Uh, let me try to, let me see if I can rewind here. Uh, type in your questions for Eric and Steve on the chat. This is your time. Right, while, they're, while they're doing that, Eric, do you want to ask me another question that I can answer quickly or whatever? Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean um, how do you feel? Um, 
you, you, you know, what do you, um, let's just ask the most obvious one. What are you working on now? I'm working on a book about cystic fibrosis, um, yes. which truly is a, a relatively rare condition, but uh, yes. it's rarer than autism, but it's not as rare as I thought. Why? Well, it turns out that all of medicine has racial biases built into it. So yes. for instance, people of color with cystic fibrosis are also underdiagnosed. But the reason why I'm writing about it now is that one of my best friends has cystic fibrosis. And yes. even though I was a medical reporter, I didn't know anything about it when he told me that he had it. And he hadn't yes. told me about it before either. Uh, and I had no idea how, A, how serious it was, but B, how much progress had been made. And now yes. because of a drug, but my book is not just about the drug, but because of the invention of a drug called Trikafta and um, things that modulate the, uh, the gene that is um, damaged in cystic fibrosis, people with cystic fibrosis, instead of dying in their childhood, or instead of dying in their teenagehood, now may live a normal lifespan. So one of the things my book is about, like, you know, my autism book focused on how the community, the autistic community really assembled itself and then um, took an existential stance in favor of itself in a sense. People with wow. cystic fibrosis are in a very interesting existential position because even people are still relatively young. We're told that they were gonna die when they were 12 or 20 or whatever. Now they're living into middle age, having families, et cetera. And so what do you do when you've been told your whole life that you're gonna die young wow. and then yeah. suddenly you live, suddenly you have the rest of your life. So that's why it's interesting to me. Um, I I await this book. I can't wait for this. I can't wait to pre-order it. Thank so you. this is this is this is a question that I want that I, that 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 is interesting. Eric and Steve, what is your favorite example of an autistic person being very honest and blunt? Oh wow, um, God, I, I I have really a lot. Boy, I feel like I have like some really uh, tasty. I can name one about myself, just so just a yeah. Just go a, for it. Yeah, go for it. I'll, 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 I'll give you. I'll give. I'll give one, uh, which was um, one time uh, I was uh, I was at I was at I was at I was, at, I, was at, I was it was one of my first days as a Capitol Hill reporter, and I was looking for uh, I was looking for one specific senator. I think this was when I was asking every Republican senator if they were going to vote if they were going to support Donald Trump if he's a nominee. I followed him. I felt I followed a United States senator into the men's room. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and then, like later, somebody said, "Look, if you do that again, you're gonna lose your Capitol press pass, buddy." So like that, that was one like just completely not understanding. That's not okay. Right. But th uh, th th that that's that that that's like that's the one that immediately comes to mind. Uh, the other one is like when I when I met John Marble for our second interview. Literally, we talk for like 30 seconds. And then I'm like, okay, do you want to get ready to talk for this interview? He's like, that's so hard to, like, no small talk whatsoever. We just right. like that too. Yeah. Well, you know, a story that, you know, I, I'm not sure if I should tell the story. It's in Neurotribes. Um, one of the people who I do not retro diagnose him, I do not, you know, I am not an, a, a diagnostic authority. Uh, the other people who I seem to retro-diagnose in neurodrives, like uh, Cavendish, the scientist in the first chapter, Henry Cavendish, um, they were actually retro-diagnosed by people like Oliver Sacks and Uta Frith. And so I felt very confident. Um, but uh, Tesla, uh, Nikola Tesla, who is you know, a genius inventor and et cetera, he, did, he certainly did have a lot of autistic traits. And this is a slightly unsavory story I remember from the book is that apparently at some point, like two of Tesla's aunts uh, asked him how, you know, how pretty they were to him or something. And Tesla said, well, you're not as ugly as the other one <laughs> or something. It's <laughs> like super blunt, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so hold on. We've, we've got some good. We, we've got some really, really good question uh, right, right here. Um, what are your opinions on the theory uh, on theory of mind and Simon Baron Cohen? 
Boy, that is a really complicated question. Um, you know, theory of mind. Uh, oh boy. The problem with theory of mind is that it got generalized into a widespread myth that autistic people do not care about other people's feelings and yes. cannot pick up on them, um, et cetera. And I know that the real theory of mind research was not that broad, but the problem was that Simon Baron Cohen presented his findings to the popular um, audiences, to mainstream audiences, uh, with you know books with titles like Zero Degrees of Empathy. You know, yeah. even if you open that such a book. And it says, well, actually, you know, not all, not all autistic people have zero degrees. It's too late. You know, what? It's, it's a what? bad headline. Right, right, exactly. And so once you've spread that headline, it doesn't even matter how much backtracking or tweaking or that's not exactly what I meant you do, you know. And so Simon Baron Cohen, I've hung out with him personally, in person. He's a very nice guy. He's done some good work. But uh, he, I don't trust him ultimately. And part of that had to do with the fact that, um, I don't want to get into this because it's a really big subject, but I peer reviewed a paper for him uh, and he let the guy get away with murder, man. Um, mm -hmm. There were three peer reviewers. I was one of them. There was an autistic woman who was a peer reviewer. The, the guy who wrote the paper said that he wasn't going to listen to the autistic reviewer's comments at all. Wow. Like just up front, like, no, wow. sorry. I'm not going to, I will not, you know, address reviewer two's comments, you know? Wow. And Simon Baron Cohen let him get away with that, which I thought was yeah. uh, unethical, you know? Yes. And Simon Baron Cohen also increased the, extreme speculation in yes. the paper to draw attention to it and to get publicity. And I feel like Simon's seeking of publicity is, his fa is a fatal flaw of his because it makes him spread stereotypes about autistic people that turn out to be profoundly damaging. So that's, that's what I think. That is... the. the uh... I echo basically what Steve said. I obviously don't know the personal situation, but I think my other issue is um, the pre presentation of this extreme male brain theory. Yeah. Um, uh, I understand that again, like it's not as cut and dry as he, as he presented it, but again, it spread that germ that, um, that allowed for even more for people to say that autism is an extremely gendered condition. Right. So, so, yeah, so, he's very good at coining catchy memes in a way, but that are bad. <laughs> you know? yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, like, even if his high, even if his fully explained thesis isn't as bad as the the, the, the right. headlines, so to speak. Right. I'm just I'm just speaking in newspaper talk yeah. right now because that's what I am. But yeah. like that 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 concerns me. Um, uh, th th this, this is this is this uh, is this is maybe one for you. Uh, all the people discussed in neurotribes are men. How many are not diagnosed autistic? But like, I know that there are girls. Wait, you know, wait, actually, yeah, do, that's not true. But that, yeah, that's not the, that's yeah. not the case because they're yeah. not, because like, yeah, you do talk about girls. So like, this is a good time to talk about right. girls and undiagnosed women. Right. Like, go ahead, let's talk about girls and women. Well, uh, the most vivid anecdote that I have about that is that Kevin Palfrey, who is a um, uh, scientist at the Yale Child Study Center, which is the most famous autism research center in America. Um, he missed his own daughter's autism until yes. she was like 12. He screens kids for autism all day. How could he yes. possibly have missed his own daughter's autism? It's because so many of the criteria for diagnosis were oriented towards male behavior. Yes. And women present differently. Or you could say autistic women, be differently, you know, yeah. they exist differently than autistic men. And so um, a lot of times autistic women fly under the radar and a lot of autistic male children um, come to the attention of authorities 
because they they're openly rebellious or you know uh etc and women are taught uh to be more compliant and more uh, you know shy and fade into the background and don't make noise and so a lot of the signs you know the parents are trained to look for are oriented towards men and um i think there's it's been absolutely wonderful in the last few years for me to not just get in touch with a, a, a lot of autistic people but to specifically talk to older autistic women in england um because really? there, there is a really great community uh there of older women who are autistic and out um and uh there is one called there's a, a group called i think they're aut angel aut angel on twitter i th i think that's what they're called but i had a meeting with um a bunch of uh people from aut angel and uh, several of them were older women and it is just thrilling to see how they come into themselves in a sense once they realize that there's an explanation for the fact that they've been treated badly their whole lives you know and an, and an older autistic woman who was diagnosed in midlife i asked her what it was like to get a diagnosis in midlife and she said getting a diagnosis was like finding the rosetta stone to myself I and, love that story. You yeah, told it to me a million yeah, times, and I yeah. love it every moment. Every yeah, time. yeah, yeah. No, it's that's Rena Core, my friend, my autistic friend, and um, so yeah, I feel like there's a lot of growth potential in the old, particularly the older female autistic community or younger too. But yeah, no, I, I I wholeheartedly agree. One was interesting is a friend of mine who is. Uh, who is gender non-binary but is femme presenting they texted me a while back and they said eric do you know like when you came to be more accepting of your autistic self did you find it harder to mask and i was like yeah because you become you you care less about what that's the a very interesting question yeah you care less about what neurotypicals think about you right and then they they said to me they said uh you know uh and i'm, I'm specifically not naming their pronouns a because they're not binary b i just don't want to you know give any hints but like it was it was interesting because they said like yeah because i find myself since i realized that i'm autistic i don't i i can't put the mask back on and, and that, right. that was that was incredible that was an incredibly uh revelatory conversation because yeah. i had because it, it made me think oh yeah no once i because like even you know growing up mm -hmm. i knew that i had what was then called asperger's but it was only once i started writing about autism and meeting other autistic people that i couldn't that i became more i can say that i became more comfortable with myself through yep. covering the autistic community yeah so i will always be grateful for the autistic community for that because like giving me that opportunity to write about them yeah. helps me to hate myself less oh that's great that's awesome um, yeah so 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 yeah i, I want to get us one more question before sure. we uh uh you know uh the 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 uh there is a good question here which is uh might there be a nexus between the disparity and the prevalence of trans identity amongst autistic people uh, yeah that's that fascinating and yeah, I mean, I don't know, you know, I don't know what the official explanation is. I don't know there is. isn't one, I don't think. But it is really fascinating how many um, autistic women in particular, it seems to me, but just from my personal anecdotal experience, embrace non-binary or uh, trans identities. Um, and one thing that really disturbed me this week was that I tweeted about the uh, the horrible so-called don't say gay bill in Florida. Yes. And I got targeted by for sort of email harassment by people saying that, you know, uh, trans activists are preying on autistic kids, especially. How can you, as the author of Neurotribes, you know, and somebody signed me up for a million anti-trans uh, mailing lists, that is horrible. The, the, one of the bad things that's happening right now is that these right-wing groups are finding common cause. So like anti-vaxxers are finding common cause yes. with Nazis, you know, 
And the same thing is happening around trans issues now. Yes, it is. The anti-neurodiversity people are using... Go on. I can't help but be reminded of how white womanhood was used to justify lynching. Oh, for sure. Uh, Oh, yeah. uh, No, it's, it's... the it is grotesque that yeah. Laura Ingraham, the uh, host on this, you know, one of the most popular television stations or television, whatever you call it, networks on yeah. earth, um, s- suggested that people who oppose the unbelievably fascistic, disgusting, and vile don't say gay bill um, are predators. You know, that, that is exactly like the blood libel uh, leveled against the Jews by saying that they were poisoning wells. That is exactly like saying anybody who is in favor of civil rights wants blacks to rape their daughter. It is absolutely disgusting. I actually wrestle with violent thoughts uh, when, I, when I see stuff like that. It, it, it does because I think that what it does is that it also let's be fair, it's also infantilizing towards autistic people because it says yes. that autistic people can't have agency and they can't understand their gender identity. Uh, we, I know plenty of autistic people who are incredibly sure of their gender identity, and many of them, because they are autistic and gender is the ultimate social norm, yeah. uh, are more willing to critique it and understand it. Like, why do I, you know, you know, not feel more masculine or more, right, more exactly. feminine? So, so so, so that is so let's be clear that not only is this transphobic because it is it yeah. is also incredibly infantilizing toward autistic people exactly uh, so i so so let's just put that out there uh we have hit the 11 we have clock yeah. mar- uh, the, yeah. the 8 p.m mark here the 11 yeah. o'clock mark here yeah. um paul is there um you, you know, uh, how, how are we right now? I mean, I think I think. Well, we've had... let me say one thing. Go ahead. Yes. To all the folks whose names I, you know, kind of recognize, particularly uh, you know, coming uh, to from Australia, <laughs> Kristen, um, thank you so much for for uh, coming. I really appreciate all of you, and uh, thanks for being my pals as well. Some uh, of these people, Steve has been wonderful enough to introduce me to. So, like, thank you, A, Steve, for doing this, and B, uh, thank you to everybody who's like, jo- like, by v- virtue of knowing Steve, I hope that like I'm kind of like I'm not no longer just a hanger on that. Like, you actually enjoy hanging out with me as well. So, like, I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for Steve for inviting me to. Thank you. To moderate this wonderful uh every time i feel like i'm talking with steve i feel like it's we're just across the table from each other so um we still need to do that soon yes but, we do <laughs> uh, you know god willing yeah. uh but this is but uh you know i think that this has been wonderful so i just want to say thank you for and it doesn't happen you. enough you know i i feel like public conversations between autistic authors and neurotypical uh authors uh, you know it, it's very it's very fruitful i feel like we could go on for hours really we, we, um, we could if it wasn't if, if, if it wasn't too late if it would right, be right. if the library no, I, it, I i can't personally but you know what i yeah. mean yeah yeah, yeah. yeah no i you, you know but like we, we can and we should continue to have these conversations they're important Definitely. conversations and i appreciate you inviting me and i appreciate the livermore library for uh creating this kind of forum this is really this is a very productive kind of forum uh these could easily go off the rails and maybe we did go a little you, you know we we jammed we riffed a little bit but like you know we we, we had fun so thank you very much to the livermore library thank you paul and i have to say i was very impressed by uh, the whole month of events that you have yes. uh, arranged thank um, you so thank you, thank you. And, and thanks for asking me paul i appreciate it well, it was uh, it was my pleasure. It was our pleasure. Everyone who's listening to you all, uh, thank you again to uh, Eric Garcia, author of "We're Not Broken," and Steve Silberman, "Neuro Tribes." This is book. Both are excellent books. Uh, um, thank you. We're so grateful to have this time with both of you. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. I cannot thank you enough. Uh, please join us for our other Livermore Reads Together events. Ho- uh, 
and thank you to the friends of the Livermore Public Library. Uh, we have more wonderful events on autism this month, um, including a conversation with Temple Grandin on, uh, on March 21st. So uh, visit livermorelibrary.net or follow us on social media to learn more about our wonderful events and programs. So uh, it's been a pleasure to Eric Garcia, to Steve Silverman, and to all our attendees. Um, thank you. Have a good night. Thank you, buddy. Thank you so much. Yeah. Take care. Thank Thanks. You. Thanks, Eric. See you, buddy. Okay. <laughs>